Welcome to our Monday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today is the beginning of my second week teaching on finances, biblical prosperity. I've entitled this teaching Financial Stewardship, and I've really tried to make it clear that it's not about you just getting things. It's not selfish. It's not greed. GOD WANTS YOU TO BE A STEWARD, AND IF YOU CAN GET TO WHERE YOU DON'T LOOK AT ALL OF YOUR ASSETS AS YOURS, BUT THEY'RE GOD'S, AND YOU'RE JUST A STEWARD, AND IF YOU START USING FINANCES TO BLESS OTHER PEOPLE, MAN, GOD WILL CAUSE A SUPERNATURAL FLOW OF FINANCES TO YOU. IF HE CAN GET IT THROUGH YOU, HE WILL GET IT TO YOU. SO WE'RE OFFERING THIS BOOK, A 166-PAGE BOOK, FOR AN OFFERING OF ANY AMOUNT, uh, THERE IS A SUGGESTED DONATION, BUT YOU SEND WHATEVER, WE'LL SEND IT TO YOU. IF YOU COULD NOT OR WOULD NOT GET THAT, I'LL GIVE THIS LITTLE BRIEF SUMMARY OF IT. IT'S ABOUT 50-PAGE BOOKLET, AND I'LL GIVE THIS TO YOU AS A FREE GIFT. THEN WE'VE ALSO GOT CD'S, DVD'S, AND OTHER THINGS. SO PLEASE TAKE ADVANTAGE OF THAT AT THE END OF OUR PROGRAM. WE'LL BE GIVING OUT ALL THAT INFORMATION. I'VE ALREADY COVERED A LOT LAST WEEK. I HADN'T GOT TIME TO GO BACK THROUGH THAT BUT uh, ON LAST FRIDAY'S BROADCAST, I WAS TEACHING OUT OF MARK CHAPTER 10, AND THIS IS WHERE A RICH YOUNG RULER CAME TO JESUS, AND HE WAS uh, COMMITTED ENOUGH TO JESUS THAT HE RAN AND FELL AT HIS FEET AND KNELT DOWN AND SAID, GOOD MASTER, WHAT MUST I DO TO INHERIT ETERNAL LIFE? AND JESUS KNEW THAT EVEN THOUGH THE OUTWARD PROFESSION LOOKED GOOD, HE KNEW HIS HEART WASN'T RIGHT. AND HE SAYS, WHY ARE YOU CALLING ME GOOD? THERE'S NONE GOOD BUT ONE. THAT'S GOD. BASICALLY, HE WAS SAYING, YOU EITHER CALL ME GOD, YOU SUBMIT TO ME AS GOD, OR QUIT CALLING ME GOOD. He, JESUS WAS EITHER WHO HE SAID HE WAS, THE WAY, THE TRUTH, AND THE LIFE. NO MAN COMES TO THE FATHER BUT BY HIM, OR HE WAS A FRAUD. There, YOU CAN'T LOOK AT IT ANY OTHER WAY. THERE ARE SOME PEOPLE THAT SAY, oh, OH, NO, JESUS WAS A GOOD PERSON, BUT YOU KNOW, BUDDHA AND HINDU and, AND ISLAM. THERE'S SOME PEOPLE THAT THINK ALLAH AND GOD ARE THE SAME. NOT SO, NOT EVEN CLOSE. AND SO THERE'S SOME PEOPLE SEE THAT WILL SAY, WELL, JESUS WAS GOOD, BUT HE WASN'T, HE WASN'T GOD. HE WASN'T THE ONLY WAY. NO, HE EITHER HAS TO BE WHO HE CLAIMED TO BE OR HE WAS A CHARLATAN, ONE OF THE TWO. YOU CAN'T, THERE IS NO MIDDLE GROUND. HE IS NOT A WAY, HE IS THE WAY. THERE IS NO SALVATION IN ANY OTHER. THERE IS NO OTHER NAME UNDER HEAVEN GIVEN AMONG MEN WHEREBY YOU MUST BE SAVED. SO JESUS uh, CALLED THIS MAN'S BLUFF AND SAYS, YOU EITHER CALL ME GOD OR QUIT CALLING ME GOOD. WELL, HE DROPPED THE GOOD AND HE JUST SAID, MASTER. AND JESUS LOVED HIM, BUT HE, he USED MONEY TO REVEAL WHAT WAS IN THIS MAN'S HEART. THIS MAN OUTWARDLY PROFESSED THAT HE HAD KEPT ALL OF THE COMMANDMENTS, THAT HE HAD HONORED HIS FATHER AND MOTHER, HE HAD NEVER LIED, HE HAD NEVER STOLEN, HE HAD NEVER DONE THESE THINGS. PERSONALLY, I BELIEVE HE BROKE ALL OF THE COMMANDMENTS. NOW, BY MAN'S STANDARDS, HE MAY NOT, BUT IF YOU GO OVER TO EXODUS, THE VERY FIRST COMMANDMENT THAT GOD GAVE IN EXODUS CHAPTER 20 IS THAT YOU SHALL HAVE NO OTHER GODS BEFORE ME. THIS MAN'S MONEY WAS HIS GOD. HE TRUSTED WHAT HIS MONEY COULD DO FOR HIM MORE THAN HE TRUSTED WHAT JESUS COULD DO FOR HIM. SO HE BROKE THE FIRST COMMANDMENT. THE TENTH COMMANDMENT LISTED IN EXODUS CHAPTER 20 IS YOU SHALL NOT COVET ANYTHING THAT BELONGS TO YOUR NEIGHBOR. THAT'S TALKING ABOUT MONEY AND WANTING THINGS AND POSSESSIONS. AND THIS MAN, HE BROKE THE FIRST AND THE TENTH COMMANDMENT WHEN HE WALKED AWAY FROM JESUS BECAUSE JESUS TOLD HIM TO SELL EVERYTHING HE HAD AND HE WOULDN'T DO IT. SO THIS MAN WAS DECEIVED. HE MAY HAVE LOOKED GOOD ON THE OUTSIDE, BUT IN HIS HEART, MONEY WAS HIS GOD. HE WAS COVETING WHAT MONEY COULD DO FOR HIM. AND THAT'S THE REASON THAT JESUS TOLD HIM TO SELL EVERYTHING. YOU KNOW, JESUS WENT INTO ZACCHAEUS'S HOUSE, AND ZACCHAEUS WAS A WEALTHY MAN, AND HE WAS A THIEF. HE WAS A TAX COLLECTOR. HE WAS COLLABORATING WITH THE ROMAN GOVERNMENT, AND THE ROMAN GOVERNMENT NOT ONLY GAVE HIM A SALARY, BUT THEN ALLOWED HIM TO OVERTAX THE JEWS, AND HE COULD KEEP WHATEVER THE DIFFERENCE WAS. SO HE HAD STOLEN MONEY FROM HIS uh, uh, FELLOW JEWS. HE HAD COLLABORATED WITH THE ENEMY, THE ROMANS. THIS WAS A BAD GUY, BUT HE WAS VERY RICH. JESUS SAW HIM UP IN A TREE AND SAID, ZACCHAEUS, COME DOWN. I'M GOING TO GO TO YOUR HOUSE TO EAT TODAY. AND ZACCHAEUS RECEIVED HIM. AND BECAUSE JESUS SHOWED HIM MERCY 
AND GAVE HIM GRACE. Zacchaeus SAID, LORD, IF I'VE WRONGED ANY MAN, I'M GOING TO PAY HIM BACK FOUR TIMES WHAT I'VE STOLEN FROM HIM, AND I'M GOING TO GIVE HALF MY GOODS TO FEED THE POOR AND ALL THESE THINGS. GOD NEVER TOLD HIM TO DO ANY OF THAT. HE DIDN'T MENTION MONEY TO Zacchaeus BECAUSE Zacchaeus' HEART WAS RIGHT. BUT WHEN YOUR HEART IS WRONG, GOD WILL USE MONEY TO REVEAL TO YOU WHERE YOUR HEART REALLY IS. THE SCRIPTURE TELLS US WE'RE SUPPOSED TO GIVE, THAT WE'RE SUPPOSED TO PUT GOD AND OTHER PEOPLE AND SEEK FIRST THE KINGDOM OF GOD. AND THERE'S A LOT OF PEOPLE THAT DON'T DO THAT. YOU MAY SAY, OH, YES, I DO. WELL, DO YOU DO IT IN YOUR MONEY? I KNOW THERE'S A LOT OF PEOPLE RIGHT NOW. I GOT TO HEAR TELEVISION SETS ALL AROUND THE WORLD CLICKING OFF. PEOPLE, hey, YOU ARE MEDDLING AND YOU HAVE NO RIGHT TO SAY THIS. I'M SAYING EXACTLY WHAT JESUS SAID. JESUS TOLD A MAN WHO RAN AND FELL AT HIS FEET AND LOOKED LIKE HE WANTED JESUS ABOVE EVERYTHING. HE WAS VERY DEMONSTRATIVE. JESUS KNEW HIS HEART WASN'T RIGHT. AND HE SAYS, YOU GO SELL EVERYTHING YOU'VE GOT AND GIVE IT TO THE POOR AND THEN COME AND FOLLOW ME. DID YOU KNOW IF I WAS PASTORING A CHURCH AND IF SOMEBODY CAME RUNNING DOWN THE AISLE AND SAID, I WANT TO JOIN THIS CHURCH, I WANT TO BE A PART OF THIS, AND I SAY, GO SELL EVERYTHING YOU'VE GOT AND GIVE IT TO THE POOR AND THEN COME JOIN THIS CHURCH. I GUARANTEE YOU, I WOULD BE BRANDED A CULT. I WOULD HAVE PEOPLE COMING OUT AGAINST ME. IN A SENSE, THAT'S EXACTLY WHAT JESUS DID RIGHT HERE. AND IT WASN'T BECAUSE HE WANTED THIS GUY'S MONEY. HE WANTED HIS HEART. AND HE KNEW THAT THIS MAN'S HEART WAS ATTACHED TO HIS MONEY. HE WANTED HIM TO GIVE UP THAT AND TO PUT JESUS FIRST IN HIS LIFE. GOD DOESN'T NEED YOUR MONEY. HE DOESN'T NEED MY MONEY, BUT HE DOES WANT YOUR HEART. AND IF, you, if YOUR HEART IS ATTACHED TO THAT MONEY SO THAT YOU WILL NOT TITHE, YOU WILL NOT GIVE WHAT GOD HAS TOLD YOU TO DO, YOU PUT YOUR NEEDS FIRST, AND ONLY IF YOU HAVE SOMETHING LEFT OVER YOU GIVE TO GOD, YOUR HEART'S NOT RIGHT. AND I KNOW THAT I'M GOING TO BE CRITICIZED. I'LL HAVE LOTS OF PEOPLE SPEAK AGAINST ME, BUT I'M NOT SAYING ANYTHING THAT THESE VERSES DON'T SAY. IF YOU CAN'T TRUST GOD IN YOUR FINANCES, THEN YOU CAN'T TRUST HIM IN OTHER THINGS. THAT'S THE LEAST USE OF YOUR FAITH ACCORDING TO LUKE CHAPTER 16, VERSE 10 and, and THROUGH 13. AND SO THIS MAN, WHEN HE WAS TOLD TO SELL EVERYTHING AND COME FOLLOW HIM AND HE WOULD HAVE TREASURE IN HEAVEN, IN VERSE 22 IT SAYS, HE WAS SAD AT THAT SAYING AND WENT AWAY GRIEVED, FOR HE HAD GREAT POSSESSIONS. THAT SHOWED YOU WHERE HIS HEART WAS. HE WOULDN'T FOLLOW JESUS BECAUSE HE WAS TRUSTING IN THAT MONEY. HE COULD NOT SEE HIMSELF LIVING WITHOUT THAT MONEY. WELL, THAT'S A STRONG STATEMENT, BUT I TELL YOU WHAT JESUS GOES ON TO SAY IS ABSOLUTELY AMAZING. AND I'm, I'M GLAD JESUS SAID THIS. IF I WOULD HAVE SAID THESE THINGS AGAIN, I'D HAVE BEEN BRANDED AS A CULT, BUT THIS IS JESUS, THE AUTHOR AND THE FINISHER OF OUR FAITH, USING MONEY TO REVEAL TO PEOPLE WHERE THEIR HEART REALLY IS. IN THE NEXT VERSE, IT SAYS, AND JESUS LOOKED ROUND ABOUT AND SAITH UNTO HIS DISCIPLES, HOW HARDLY SHALL THEY THAT HAVE RICHES ENTER INTO THE KINGDOM OF GOD? MAN, THAT'S, that's QUITE A STATEMENT. DID YOU KNOW THAT YOU MAY NOT CONSIDER YOURSELF TO BE RICH, BUT COMPARED TO THE WORLD... AGAIN, THIS PROGRAM IS BROADCAST ALL OVER THE WORLD. OVER FIVE BILLION PEOPLE COULD GET IT. AND SO I KNOW I'VE GOT PEOPLE WATCHING IN OTHER COUNTRIES. BUT IF YOU'RE IN ONE OF OUR DEVELOPED COUNTRIES, YOU KNOW, ACROSS EUROPE, OR IF YOU'RE IN THE UNITED STATES OR SOMETHING LIKE THAT, YOU MAY NOT THINK YOU ARE VERY RICH, BUT COMPARED TO SOME OF THE PLACES I'VE BEEN, LIKE IN MEXICO, WHERE PEOPLE ARE BORN, ON A CITY DUMP IN A CARDBOARD BOX, AND THEY ARE... I MEANT SOME PEOPLE THAT WERE 30 AND 40 YEARS OLD AND HAD NEVER WALKED OFF OF THAT CITY DUMP. THEY WERE BORN THERE. THEY LIVED THERE. THEY ATE THE TRASH THAT WAS DUMPED THERE. THEY LIVED IN CARDBOARD BOXES. COMPARED TO MANY, MANY, MANY PEOPLE AROUND THE WORLD, YOU ARE RICH. AND JESUS HERE IS SAYING, HOW HARD IS IT FOR THOSE THAT HAVE RICHES TO ENTER INTO THE KINGDOM OF GOD? AND IN VERSE 24, IT SAYS, AND THE DISCIPLES WERE ASTONISHED AT HIS WORDS. BUT JESUS ANSWERED AGAIN AND SAITH UNTO THEM, CHILDREN, HOW HARD IS IT FOR THEM THAT TRUST IN RICHES TO ENTER INTO THE KINGDOM OF GOD? DID YOU KNOW IF WE DIDN'T HAVE VERSE 24, IF ALL YOU HAD WAS VERSE 23, WHERE IT SAYS IT'S HARD FOR PEOPLE THAT HAVE MONEY TO ENTER INTO THE KINGDOM OF GOD, MAN, THAT WOULD BE A HARD PILL TO SWALLOW. THAT WOULD MAKE IT LOOK LIKE THAT IF YOU'VE GOT MONEY, THEN YOU CAN'T TRUST GOD. BUT HE GOES ON IN THIS 24TH VERSE TO SAY, 
it's hard for those who trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. So it's not money that's the problem. It's our trust in money. It's like it says over in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, it's not money that's the problem. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. If you think that money itself is evil, well, then you ought to get rid of all of that filthy stuff and send it in to me or send it in to somebody else. Amen. And get rid of that filthy stuff if money is evil. No, there's nothing wrong with money. It's the love of money. It's your trust in money is what Jesus is saying. How hard is it for those who trust in money to enter into the kingdom of God? And then in verse 25, it says, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Do you know, that is such a radical statement that my whole life growing up, I heard people say, well, he couldn't mean a physical camel, this huge animal going through the eye of a sewing needle. And so they tried to come up with another explanation. And I heard my whole life that, you know, in the city of Jerusalem, they had these huge gates that they would open during the day, but at night they would close the gate. And then there was a smaller gate where, you know, an individual could enter uh, in and out through it. And that was called the eye of the needle. And that this was Jesus speaking about that for you to enter into the kingdom of God, it's like a camel going through this little tiny gate in the big gate called the eye of the needle. And a camel couldn't do it if it had any burdens on. You had to take everything off and get the camel down on its knees to scoot through this gate. And that's what they was talking about. You know, when I was in Jerusalem, we had a tour guide and I asked him about this. And I said, is there a gate that there is the eye of a needle in it? He said, oh yeah, but it's on the other side of Jerusalem. We don't have time to go over there. I pressed him two or three times and finally I said, I don't believe that there is such a thing. And he just kind of got serious and he said, what makes you think that? And I said, I believe that 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 is just something that people came up with to try and explain away this passage. I believe Jesus was talking about a physical camel going through the eye of a sewing needle. And this tour guide, he says, you're right, there is no eye of a needle. He said, we tell people that. And I said, why would you tell them that? And he said, tourism is a huge deal in Israel. And uh, we all have to be licensed by the government. And the government tells us that we are just supposed to make these pilgrims, uh, you know, have a great experience regardless of what it takes. He even told me about one time that one of the people on the bus said, I want to see the burning bush that Moses was at. And he said that there had been a fire the week before out behind one of these service stations and there was a bush out there that had burnt. So anyway, he stopped and he told, here's Moses burning bush. And he said, all of these tourists were out there taking pictures of this bush that had burned, thinking that's the one that Moses saw. People are gullible. And anyway, my point is, I believe that this is talking about a physical camel going through the eye of a little sewing needle. And to prove that, look at this. In verse 26, it says, and they were astonished out of measure. Now, they had been astonished before when he said, how hard is it for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God? But then it says, now they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? They wouldn't have been astonished out of measure if they would have known that this was talking about a little gate in a bigger gate, and it wasn't impossible. It was just hard to do. That wouldn't have astonished them out of measure. Jesus goes on to say in verse 27, And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible. He didn't say it's difficult that you got to unladen the camel and scoot it through on its knees. No, it wasn't just difficult or hard. It's impossible. With man, it's impossible, but not with God, for with God, all things are possible. These are radical, radical statements. This is putting our relationship with money way higher, way more important than what most people give. Mo again, most people think that you know, walking in uh, prosperity and trusting God in this area of giving and tithes, that that is for a mature Christian. Let's just talk to Christians, uh, people about getting born again and then little baby stuff and work up to these important things. Jesus used a person's attitude towards money to reveal his heart, that his heart wasn't right to get right with God. And then he says it's hard for people that trust 
in money to enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a person who is trusting in their riches to enter into the kingdom of heaven. He says, with man, that's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. This isn't against money. There's nothing wrong with money. It's your trust. And you can tell where your trust is by your actions. Are you giving? Do you give a tithe and even beyond a tithe? Man, I can just hear the gears working in people's minds and hearts right now all around the world. There are many of you that have never connected this and you think, oh, I love God and man, I'm seeking God, but you, you've never been a consistent giver. You've never trusted God in this area of finances. By Jesus' own teaching right here, if you believe the Bible at all, what are you going to do with these passages? If you are trusting in your riches, which you, you, can, you can whitewash it and say it any way you want to, but if you aren't giving a minimum of a tithe, and if you aren't giving above that, if you aren't trusting the Scriptures that when you give, it's given back unto you, if you aren't doing that, you aren't trusting God in this area of finances. You trust your money. You say, I've got to have these needs met. And you do. It's, there's nothing wrong with you paying your bills. You're supposed to pay your bills, but you need to look at God as your source. And you say, I can't do it. I don't have enough. If you, well, if you really trusted God, you couldn't afford not to give. You can't afford not to trust God. Plus, God has promised you. He goes on to say, Right here, let me just continue to read. In verse 28, Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. Why did Peter say that? Because Jesus had just said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a sewing needle than it is for a person who is trusting in their riches to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So Peter wanted to make it clear that, God, we've left everything for you. Peter left his wife and his mother-in-law he left his home. He left his fishing business. He gave up everything. And so he was professing, God, I ha I'm not trusting in my money. I'm trusting in you. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man. That means that there is not a single person, male or female. This is something that is without exception. There is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. But many that are first shall be last and the last first. This is a promise that Jesus gave that any person who quits trusting in their riches and starts using those resources to build God's kingdom and to bless and to follow His instructions, there is not a single person who does that but what you will receive back 100 times in this life. It didn't say just in the life to come. There are some people that will say, well, I'm giving, but in heaven, I'm laying up treasures in heaven. Again, you can do that according to uh, Matthew chapter 6, but you will also receive treasures back in this life 100-fold. That means 100 times. If you give a dollar, you'll get $100 back if you give in faith. I do have to qualify that because over in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3, it says, If you give all of your goods to feed the poor, or even if you give your body to be burned and don't do it motivated by God's kind of love, it profits you nothing. So your attitude behind the gift is more important than the gift. And so if you give a dollar out of a pure heart, you're going to receive back a hundred dollars in this life. But it depends on that motivation. If your motivation is wrong, then it won't work. There are so many people, and I'm going to be dealing on this before I get through with this series, that are using the Old Testament motivation to tithe out of Malachi chapter 3, where you're cursed if you don't tithe. And did you know if you are giving because you are paying a debt, there's so many people that look at a tithe as a debt, we've been redeemed from the curse of the law. 
THE LAW HAS BEEN SATISFIED THROUGH JESUS. BUT DOES THAT MEAN THAT WE DON'T GIVE ANYMORE, THAT WE DON'T TITHE ANYMORE? Uh, HEBREWS CHAPTER 7 TALKS ABOUT THE TITHE IN THE NEW COVENANT, THAT JESUS RECEIVES TITHES. I BELIEVE TITHING IS A BIBLICAL PRINCIPLE THAT WAS IN EFFECT BEFORE THE LAW WAS PUT INTO PLACE. ABRAHAM PAID TITHES IN GENESIS CHAPTER 14. SO THE LAW WASN'T EVEN GIVEN YET, AND YET ABRAHAM GAVE TITHES. SO TITHING IS A BIBLE PRINCIPLE, NOT JUST AN OLD TESTAMENT LAW PRINCIPLE. BUT WE DON'T GIVE WITH THE MOTIVATION OF THE LAW ANYMORE. YOU DON'T GIVE TO PAY A DEBT. YOU DON'T GIVE TO ESCAPE BEING CURSED. IF YOU ARE GIVING OUT A DEBT OUT OF OBLIGATION GRUDGINGLY AND OF NECESSITY, AS IT SAYS OVER IN 2 CORINTHIANS CHAPTER 9, VERSE 7, THEN IT DOESN'T PROFIT YOU. IT DOESN'T PLEASE GOD. YOU GOT TO HAVE THE RIGHT ATTITUDE. SO IF YOU GIVE WITH THE RIGHT ATTITUDE, THERE IS NOT A SINGLE PERSON WHO GIVES TRULY TRUSTING GOD, TRULY GIVING OUT OF A HEART OF LOVE, BUT WHAT YOU WILL RECEIVE BACK 100 TIMES IN THIS LIFE. MAN, THAT'S AWESOME. AND DID YOU KNOW THAT THE AVERAGE RELIGIOUS MINISTER TODAY WILL HATE ME FOR SAYING THIS. THEY DO NOT BELIEVE THIS. THEY DO, they do NOT BELIEVE THAT YOU CAN PROMISE PEOPLE A HUNDREDFOLD RETURN ON THEIR GIVING IN THIS LIFE. BUT THAT IS EXACTLY WHAT JESUS IS SAYING. THERE IS NO WAY AROUND THIS. THE ONLY QUALIFICATION I PUT ON THAT IS THIS ATTITUDE OF THE HEART, AS IT SAYS IN 1 CORINTHIANS 13, 3. IF YOU GIVE WITH THE WRONG MOTIVE, IT PROFITS YOU NOTHING. BUT IF YOU GIVE WITH THE RIGHT MOTIVE, TRUSTING IN THE LORD AND NOT TRUSTING IN YOUR MONEY, THERE IS NOT A SINGLE PERSON BUT WHAT YOU WILL RECEIVE 100 TIMES BACK IN THIS LIFE ON WHAT YOU GAVE WITH PERSECUTIONS. MOST PEOPLE WOULD LIKE THAT NOT TO HAVE THAT WITH PERSECUTIONS. AND I DON'T BELIEVE THAT THIS IS JUST PERSECUTIONS IN GENERAL. YOU'RE GOING TO BE PERSECUTED FOR SAYING WHAT JESUS SAID. YOU'RE GOING TO BE PERSECUTED FOR PROSPERITY. YOU KNOW, I'VE GOT SOME OF MY FRIENDS THAT I'M NOT GOING TO NAME THEIR NAMES, BUT THEY ARE VERY PROSPEROUS. THEY GET CRITICIZED ALL OF THE TIME. AND YET I CAN GUARANTEE THESE PEOPLE ARE NOT TRUSTING IN THEIR MONEY. THEY'RE TRUSTING IN GOD, BUT THEY GIVE, THEY GIVE, THEY GIVE. AND BECAUSE OF IT, THEY GET BACK AND PEOPLE CRITICIZE THEM. BUT YOU SHOULD NEVER CRITICIZE A PERSON'S HARVEST UNTIL YOU SEE HOW MUCH SEED THEY'VE PLANTED. PEOPLE THAT ARE CRITICIZING the, SOME OF THESE MINISTERS, there, THERE ARE SOME THAT DO THINGS INCORRECTLY, BUT THERE ARE MINISTERS THAT ALL THEY'RE DOING IS JUST REAPING WHAT THEY'VE SOWN. AND WHAT THE PROBLEM IS, YOU ARE JUDGING THEM BY THE WAY YOU SOW. YOU SOW VERY LITTLE, AND SO YOU CAN'T SEE REAPING THAT WAY. BUT IF YOU WERE TO SOW AS MUCH AND AS ABUNDANTLY AS SOME OF THESE MINISTERS HAVE DONE, I GUARANTEE YOU, YOU WOULD REAP IT BACK A HUNDREDFOLD IN THIS LIFE. I WANT TO THANK YOU FOR WATCHING OUR YOUTUBE CHANNEL AND THE PROGRAMS THAT WE HAVE AVAILABLE. AND I WANT TO ENCOURAGE YOU THAT YOU CAN GET THE MATERIALS THAT WE'VE OFFERED. ALSO, I'D LIKE TO ENCOURAGE YOU TO LIKE OUR PROGRAM AND SUBSCRIBE TO WHAT WE'RE DOING. WE HAVE A LOT OF MATERIAL, AND I BELIEVE IT'LL BE A REAL BLESSING TO YOU. SO THANK YOU FOR BEING A PART OF IT. GOD BLESS YOU.